Welcome to another Unwinding with Fiber and Fabric. I just finished re recording a 40 minute podcast without my microphone turned on. I was going to share with you <laughs> footage of me plying from a center pool ball. This, um, let's see, Raimi, otherwise known as Chinese nettle and um, Chinese silk grass. But alas, the camera was on, but the microphone wasn't. I even did a test for sound and light, but I forgot to actually listen to the test. So instead of watching me um, ply, you're going to see me um, nitty naughty <laughs> off this fiber as I tell you about it. Yes, things happen. And in the last video, my um, kittens got very rambunctious. The video that I'm not going to be sharing got very rambunctious, bumped into the camera. It was just all, you know, I guess all doomed from the start. But the truth is I have, um, I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to put together a video this week because I've been resting for the first time in a very long time. I've been able to read a book and really rest. But I have an English paper piecing block I want to share with you. I have a finished wall hanging I want to share with you. And I want to talk to you about this interesting fiber known as Raimi. So let's just go ahead and get into um, the fiber. And we will make lemonade out of lemons. Or in this case, <laughs> yarn or thread out of Raimi. So as you know, um, oh wow, that, that wrapped up very quickly. It's a very tiny little skein. Uh, I did, um, when I finished, I, I finished my um, Himalayan stinging nettle yesterday and I really actually enjoyed, I got into a rhythm and I enjoyed it and I was actually doing a longer drafting then I had been, I was moving past the inchworm phase of, of figuring out the fiber. And when I was done, I was like, well, you know, even though I wasn't sure how I was going to feel and if it was going to happen, I pulled some of this out and I started spinning it. And, um, and actually, before I talk about the Raimi anymore, let me just show you this, the stinging nettle. I mean, there you have it. That, I got into a rhythm and I really enjoyed it. And it is a little, on, you can see the fuzzy ends, but it's not scratchy. And I'll talk about that more here in just a minute. Uh, that's my um, flax that I have. But the thing that I wanted to share about um, the Raimi that really kind of surprised me is that its texture, um, I, I, I mentioned the difference between the stinging nettle and the flax, and I thought the Raimi was somewhere in between. And that is true. There, there, it is more, more like um, the texture, I think, of the um, the flax than the stinging nettle. But what really surprised me when I started to to work with it is it actually feels like cotton. You know how cotton has, if you've ever spun cotton, cotton has kind of. I think the way I'd like to describe it is kind of a like um, bread flour. It has that kind of flowery, kind of that starchy, um, powdery type feel to it. This has very much a similar feel to it. And that's the fibers that I have. I think this is, especially after having spun it, I think that this would be a really good fiber to potentially card um, like you do cotton and try to spin it more like cotton. I may have to revisit that notion again in a, in a bit, but I was really taken by that because I think it's more in the family like the, the Himalayan stinging nettle and the, um, the flax. I think it's more in that family of fibers, but it has a very cotton-like feel to it. It did make it a little bit harder to spin in a worsted, um, to have a nice smooth, finish there's more lumpy bumpies than i had definitely more lumpy bumpies than i had with um 
the, the Himalayan nettle. This was, oh, um, you can see it. Th this was just fabulous. And, I, and, and this was me spinning it in a thick spin because I was uncomfortable, you know, still trying to get comfortable with the fiber. And this is definitely sewing um, thick, but sewing thread consistency. This is definitely um, lace weight crochet thread fiber. So by the end of spinning this, and I did, I spin, I spun everything that was on the, that I prepared on the disc stuff. I really enjoyed it, which is why I went ahead and grabbed the Raimi, even though I wasn't sure if I was going to do a podcast today. And <laughs> I did a podcast. I recorded the whole thing, but the microphone wasn't on. <sighs> Those of you who've watched my videos for a long time will know that um, I, uh, <laughs> I like I, I craft to to handle my um, stress and to um, handle anxiety and and to help with um, you know a number of um, keep my my body moving and overcome physical challenges. <laughs> I had just after having recorded last week's podcast, I ended up having um, good news, but news that caused me to have quite a bit of anxiety. And when all of it, all of the dust settled, I was exhausted, but I was exhausted in a way that I could finally rest. Not exhausted in a way that you feel like, you know, you just need to, to zone out or to do your crafts in order to take your mind off of it. I was able to finally rest. I was able to finally um, get a little extra sleep and read a book, or I should say multiple books. I love reading little cozy mysteries. So I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to record this video today because... I had reached such a state of calm and <laughs> relaxed that I wasn't sure I was going to be awake enough to record. Clearly, I was awake enough to get the camera going, but not awake enough to turn on the microphone. <laughs> ah, so um, I had this, though. I, I enjoyed it last night. It, it energized me. It made me feel like I could do this again. So that's why. I'm making this video for the second time while I'm sticking with it. So the stinging nettle was an absolute um, surprise itself. Moving on to the Raimi, now that I've spun three different fibers, I can definitely say this, well, you can just even see. Um, it looked, to me, and, and again, if you haven't spun the cotton, um, you won't really recognize, but this is really smooth. Even the flax is very smooth, um, straight type feeling fiber. The Raimi, really, it looks to me, I would have a hard time not thinking it was cotton if it weren't for the fact that I have it in the unspun form. And I can look at it in the unspun form and recognize it as not being cotton. But its spun form is very much like cotton. It looks a lot like cotton. It feels a lot like cotton. Um, when you, even if you were to get, compare cotton fabric to linen fabric, you will notice that cotton fabric is kind of soft with a little bit of a brushed kind of fluffiness to it. Think of like a, um, you know, if, if you have a flannel has a little brush, a little, little um, halo-y type texture, a little bloom on it. This has that, whereas the nettle and the flax, if you look at linen fabric, linen, it's smooth. It is a smooth, um, a little bit of a, a sheen type, you know, a flat, um, no fluffiness to it. The Raimi really looks and feels a lot like cotton. So I'll be very curious to 
compare this to the cottons that I spin later on, both um, the Pima cotton that I have and the Egyptian cotton to see how it looks and compares at that point. So that is my what is now a shortened version of what I think I did before. Cause I was actually, I showed spinning it from a um, center pool ball. I will tell you spinning this from a center pool ball was a breeze. I had one break in the, um, in I think that I had to deal with, but it was a breeze. Spinning this was not, and maybe I'll even put in a clip of my, uh, a close up clip of dealing with this that I have. Um, <laughs> this spinning this from a center pool ball was a mistake it gripped on itself it made little bits of rat nests it was definitely <laughs> a challenge so i have that video so who knows maybe i'll clip together and, and share that if i'm brave we'll see but since i have um i'm obviously going to have a shorter video than i had planned let's just go ahead and move on to the um the english paper piecing the block of the um week is a hexagon pinwheel and put a piece of paper behind it so you can't see through it as much there we go so that center hexagon which is the same size as the outer ones but it is made of little pieces that have been sewn together that's creating the pinwheel. So this is um, the the name that I found from year, you know, in the, the archives of blocks. It is um, a hexagon pinwheel. But what I've done is I have put it inside um, inside a, in a block. It's actually pieced. It's not it's not applied. It is actually pieced into the block. So. The PDF that I'll post, put a description in the below. Below, I'll have it on my my um, uh, my blog, pithyponderings.com. It is what we sometimes recognize as a segment of a grandma's flower garden block or segment. Okay, this rosette, this this flower segment. It is that segment but instead of having it to where you attach that segment to a bunch of other segments like it i have set it in this block and the pattern will include all of the template pieces to sew this together and as i've said in my last one i have not trimmed this block up yet i'm saving that until the end it will be trimmed to uh, to 10 and a half inches so that when it's finished it's a 10 inch block in the quilt that i'm making but that is the block that I wanted to share um, this week, the hexagon pinwheel. Now, with that being said, the hexagon pieces, you don't have to put a pinwheel. You could just make an extra one of the solid hexagons and go from there. You could make the traditional segment, make a bunch of them and sew them together and have a flower, grandma's flower garden. You could do the pinwheels and have a grandma's flower garden pinwheel. The block that I'm providing, as I said in the past, it is not a tutorial. It does not have it, it, it does not have intense instructions. It's just the template pieces that you can cut out with a picture of the block and some suggested quantities of fabric, which of course for a single block is way more fabric than you probably actually need. These individual blocks can be done with scraps. I am doing them from vintage. 1930s um, and 40s and 50s type fabrics that I have a small little stash of. They're all um, uh, definitely fabrics that, except for the muslin around it, fabrics that predate the polyester um, fabrics and dye and the modern, you know, the the polyester dyed fabric, the dyed fabrics that go along with that. They're they're pre 1950. Um, based on just looking at them and researching them, the little stash that I have. In order to have some solids, this is a, fa a vintage fabric as well, but in order to have some solids for some of the blocks, I am dipping into a, a small stash of 
remnants from hand dyeing that I did 25 years ago. They were, um, the fabrics were on a muslin like this. It's a similar weight, um, a little bit tighter weave than the vintage fabrics are, but it is a similar weight. It's all 100% cotton. You can use whatever it is you want to use. Um, I'm using 100% cotton um, thread, 100% cotton fabrics. Because I'm using the vintage um, fabric, I'm trying to keep everything um, similar to that. If you're using modern fabrics, use whatever you want. I will tell you that I have a quilt that is probably nearing the antique stage of life. It was well used. It was made by my husband's gra um, great grandmother. It is well used. It's probably at nearing the hundred year mark. And there are um, fabrics in it that have completely disintegrated. It was clearly made with different weights of 100% cotton. So there was it, it predates the polyester that, you know, that came out. Everything in it is predating that. So it's not a um it's not a situation of having a poly cotton with a cotton and the cotton didn't hold up the same way the poly cotton would be. Now it is 100% cotton, but it is clear that it had heavier cottons, maybe from feed sex, and lighter cottons, maybe from blouses. Um, a scrap quilt, but where the thinner cottons were, those have almost entirely disintegrated. Um, it's not, and it's not like on the out, like <laughs> my first large quilt that I made, the outer edges have been worn away from use. It is all throughout the quilt, the thinner material did not hold up as long as the thicker material. Now I say this not to tell you to run out and buy thicker material or to run out and buy, you know, um, really expensive quilting cotton. No, I'm telling you this as a similar fabrics will age in a similar fashion. The first quilt that I made, the first um, king size quilt, I should say, that I made, I had a muslin in it. I had um, fabrics that were from the same, what I thought was the same brand of manufacturing. Some of them completely faded, are completely faded. Some of them are threadbare. The muslin <laughs> is very thre threadbare because it was a thinner, um, it was a thinner um, weight a lighter weight of fabric than the prints. And this quilt is now 29 years old, 28, 29 years old. And it is, um, it's threadbare. I cut away all the outer borders because my husband, um, with his military haircut and his whiskers and he likes to burrow, um, wore the fabric just away. So I cut away the outer borders and it's just the inside. It was a flying geese um, uh, pattern that was designed. Uh, it was one of the Eleanor Burns flying geese, very similar color scheme as to what her <laughs> flying geese pattern actually had. And the center of it is now with my daughter. She takes it with her when she's taken it to Mongolia and she's taken it now to Colombia. It is um, there's very little batting. It had it had polyester batting in it. There's very little batting left, if, if any. Um, she is hand applying replacement pieces on the completely threadbare areas, hand quilting um, lots and lots of stitches in order to to stabilize um, anything that's weak, and it works. That quilt was made a hundred percent, hundred percent cotton. 100% purchased at the same time in what seemed to be the same, what I thought at the time was the same brand of fabrics. It obviously wasn't. The dye processes, the dye, the fading, it, it shows the difference. So the key with what I'm trying to say here is that it's aged equally though. 
while some of the blocks may have become th threadbare a little bit faster than the other, for the most part, it's aged equally. The center of that quilt has held up fairly equally. The, the, the real weak area was the muslin that I used was a lighter weight muslin than the, um, than the, the, the prints, the calicoes. So when you're choosing your fabrics, just keep that in mind. It's not so much about being a fabric snob, and I certainly am not one to run out to um, uh, and buy the most expensive quilting cottons out there. It's about having a weight that's similar. If you have fabrics that are heavier than others, you'll have different drag, you'll have different pulling. It will wear differently. And if you're trying to create something that is going to be well loved, Regardless of the fabrics that you use, it is helpful if the fabrics are similar. Now, with that being said, I have seen people combining every type of fabric under the sun into a quilt. And you can do that. If that is what you want to do, you can do that. It just may not wear evenly. But if that's the case, do what I do. Cut off the pieces, make pillows out of them. We can upcycle our quilts if we'd like to. We do not have to treat them as in treasures that have to be maintained. We have a lot more archivists and historians keeping archival pieces. Our own home use stuff does not have to be treated that way. We can use them. We can love them. We can make them threadbare. We can upcycle them. Quilts were made to be loved and used. And if they show wear and tear, they were loved and they were used. And by all means, finding a way to incorporate them in your life and use them and love them, that's what we should be doing. That is honoring the memory of the quilter who made the quilt. The only reason I don't have my antique ones out is I'm really kind of right now a little short on space. <laughs> And five years into this house, those items are still, for the most part, in storage, um, safely protected while I'm still working through evacuating my house of my children's stuff <laughs> and getting things sorted. So I have them because I'm still working on the archiving and the, the documenting of them. But if you, and because they are the family memory, they are something I'm passing to my kids. However, with that being said, if you find a thrift store finds of quilting, use them. That is the true honoring of a quilt, is to use them. There are art pieces that will remain art pieces. If they are made to be a bed quilt, then our best honoring of the quilter who made them is to, to use them, to snuggle up with them. If they're threadbare in areas, Take the areas that are still in good shape, make them into pillows. I will probably get people who will be very upset with what I'm saying, but it's the truth. It's what my grandmothers and my great grandmothers all would have said. And yeah, use them. That's, that's, that's what they're made for. So when you're going through, if you're wanting to do this, don't feel like you have to go and, you know, Search out a certain type of fabric where you can, you can definitely use whatever you have on hand. With that being said, though, you're going to have better results when using an even weave, sturdy, woven fabric versus a t-shirt fabric. I know a number of people like to use, um, a, a number of people in, in the UK like to use um, I keep hearing him talk about a Liberty print print and I did a little in a Liberty ton, I think is what it was called. I've looked it up. It is fabric designed for a lightweight shirt. The reason they like it is because that thinner weight fabric is so much easier. It's still an even weave. It gets a nice crisp edge, but it drapes. It's easier to get around the pieces and so tiny little stitches. I am using. There is what may actually be feed sack or not, but I have a feeling it's more of a 40s, not a feed sack. I am using vintage fabric, thick. I mean, you can even see, I think even in this, you can see 
the, the weave of the yellow. I am using a 50 weight um, cotton thread to sew them together. Occasionally you can see my stitches and sometimes you can't. It is crisp, it is easy to stitch, but there is a reason that I think that the English paper, paper piecing likes the thinner fabric and the much thinner thread. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be. So I have tried to find similar weight fabric, similar um, weave structure. That's what I've aimed for. And then I'm making it work. So if you want to try it, I will have the pattern in the description below. You can find the link. Um, you can give it a try. And otherwise, it's just inspiration. But I'm hoping that even if you're not a quilter, my, my discussion about the quilts and it, it is something that you can benefit from. Because I think we do, and, and this goes for knitting, this goes for all of our um, handwork that we do. Yes, we're putting a lot of time and energy in it, and we want it cared for well. But cared for well is not the same as not using it. We want it used and cared for well. Those two things are different. Used means wear it, snuggle with it, get it dirty, and then care for the cleaning of it and the preserving of it. And one of the things that I have learned is that while we do not want to overwash our fibers, especially when we talk about our wools and stuff, they, a good airing is what a lot of times they need. The Oils that come off of our um, face and our hair, especially, if they get into the quilt fabric, if they get into your quilts and they're not washed out, they can help degrade the fabric. So when you're dealing with a quilt, and anybody who has a pillow, cotton pillowcase on their pillow will know, it will, you, there's a lot of oils that come off around our head and our face. And those oils will degrade our quilts. So a good wash is actually going to help preserve the quilt rather than wear out. Yes, it's going to fade. Yes, you know, you're going to have that issue. But it will stay healthy. The cotton will stay healthy if it's clean. Okay? So I know that the next question somebody might ask. <laughs> And by the way, I'm going to do this as a premiere, just like I did last week, because that was so much fun. But I know the question that somebody is going to probably ask is, well, how often do I wash my quilts? The quilt on my bed that I'm using on a daily basis, nightly basis, I am washing that probably, all right, so if I were, I'm, the hypothetical situation of if I wash my sheets weekly, I may toss my quilt in the dryer weekly to get the cat hair off of it. But I probably only put it in the wash once a month. That will do the trick. And I use warm water. Um, and I use a good, um, um, not a detergent. It's funny, I was looking at for wool, anybody that study wool. The detergents that we now have most of that, you know, especially here in the United States, detergents were made to clean the polycottons, the polyesters. What we want when we're dealing with natural fibers is a surfactant. I think that's how we pronounce it. And so I will use bio, and this is the key if you're not sure how to find it, biodegradable soaps in laundry soap form. They are our friend. <laughs> They help remove the grease, take it away, remove it from the product. They are good for our natural fibers in that sense of removing the body oils and the greases and such. So the same kind of things that I would use with my wool, I would, de I, and that's that's when I first started um, washing my wool. That's what I re researched and did, and and I've switched to that for my own um, clothing purposes as well. I want something that is easily biodegradable. I want something that 
removes and breaks up the oils so it can remove and be washed away. And so that's what I do with my quilt. So the only time that I wash my quilt more frequently, I have cats. And they throw up on my quilt. And when they throw up on my quilt, um, and it's the middle of the night, I, just like if I were dealing with a baby, um, clean up the mess, okay? And then after having removed, because the cat's um, bile will have acids, I will clean up the mess, soak it with water, and then it will go, when I'm functioning, um, it will go into the wash and have a good clean. But in between those cleanings, I toss it in the dryer to remove any of the cat hair and the dander and, and such and to freshen it up. The same can be done by putting it out on a clothesline and getting a good blast of sunshine and, and breeze. That works, that works as well. <sighs> so, but yes, I will wash it in the machine and then I'll put it in the dryer. And yes, I have had to purchase a very large capacity um, washing machine in order to be able to handle a king size <laughs> quilt. <laughs> all that cotton in there. It's a heavy quilt when it's all said and done. So, because I like my quilts to hang completely over my queen size bed. They, it, it actually almost reaches the floor on, <laughs> on three sides. So, again, the block is there. That's my discussion. This video recording is so completely different than the last one. But I'm going to end with, ta-da, my happy little Halloween um, wall hanging. And I wanted to show the back. It has a sleeve because this actually hangs on the back of a door. Specifically, this right here to this side of me, on the other side of this, is my sewing room, which was originally with this house a uh, semi-enclosed porch which the previous owners put glass windows in. And so it's an enclosed um, porch. It has, it was, it was interesting because it had brick wall halfway up and then openings that the windows, you know, went in. So it was, it might've been a screened in porch. Probably, I, I have a feeling it was probably initially a screened in porch that windows were eventually put in. But there is a door, an outside door that goes into my in and out inside room. And it is the perfect place to hang this. And it gives me lots and lots of joy and happiness to have it. it it's a happy quilt. When I was putting together the different blocks, the jack-o'-lantern was an easy one. The bat took me a little bit more fiddling to figure it out, to how to create that, how to um, create the pattern. I wanted to do a ghost and that just made my brain hurt. So instead I put together a cat that didn't exactly make my brain hurt less, but he is so cute. And now you can see up close that he has a nose and a mouth. From a distance, it just looks like he has a nose. <laughs> I wanted to do the ghost, but instead I just brought in ghost fabric. I have the spider webs and I even managed to find a little bit of a um, homage to the witches of the Halloween season by that little purple fabric. It's made me really happy. It came together kind of um, organically when it came to putting the fabrics together. I'm very pleased. I am not planning to make these patterns um, on my, my, um, my blog. However, if you are interested, if you really do want, I could try to put together a PDF that has the different blocks and tells you the dimensions of my borders. I realized in looking at this, if I had turned the block 90 degrees, this would have been a really nice table runner um, size. It's great for the back of a door. Before I'm done, I wanted to show you, I have quilted it with white, but if you look, let me see if I can, You'll also see there's some quilting stitches right here. I used white and black to quilt this. Where there's black on the front, I didn't want the black to show, so, or I didn't want the white to show on the black. It's a wall hanging. I can do whatever I want with it. The fabric on the back is black fabric that I have bleach um, removed 
color from. Um, I have since learned, and I'm really pleased to learn this, when you are using bleach to remove color from a fabric for, you know, um, kind of a tie-dye type effect, the tie-dyeing community recommends, after having done the bleach soak and rinsing it, to then put it in a bath of um, hydrogen peroxide water to neutralize the bleach. And that is a brilliant tip. Um, so the tie-dyeing community has been a wonderful source of new information. Ah, <sighs> yes. I think I was going to say, I don't know if I, I, I think I keep forgetting to say this, but I may have already said this. I can't remember now. I'm using with, in some of these blocks, I need some more solids. So I'm using 25, 20, actually 28 year old um, hand dyed fabrics of my own. It's good to know about the neutralizing of the removal of color um, because I did not actually know that at the time I was doing some of this. And while this is fine, I've washed it enough times, I know some red that I had, I could almost still smell a little bit of the bleach um, in it. So it's really good to know these little tri tricks. It's good to have a different community to pull resources from. So if this is something that you would be interested in me taking the time and putting together a pattern because you'd like to actually reproduce something like this, I can certainly um, give it a try. It's not going to be in at the time of this video going up <sighs> because I haven't really wrapped my head around whether I, I want to. <laughs> the truth is, is the bat is fairly easy, um, not too fiddly. The jack-o'-lantern is very simple. And I know there's a number of people that actually create patterns like this that you can purchase. Um, the cat has some fiddliness, and that brings me to the funny story. With English paper piecing, you're sewing the blocks together while leaving the templates in place um, to give you a crisp edge and to sew them together. And somebody in one of the, the different chats had uh, um, said, oh my goodness, I left one of the papers in and it's now quilted. Is it going to be a problem? It's not a problem. People actually used to actually leave in the papers. Uh, in you know, going back far, far enough. Um, it was an extra layer initially, but it will wash out. In my case, I'm using chipboard, a heavier cardboard. Leaving those in could be a problem. They're not only be a little stiff, you'd think I'd be able to find them all. But as I was quilting, I found one here in the, uh, the bat. Um, and I chuckled when I removed it. And then thinking, well, Certainly, I've got. I, I mean, I had really tried to take them all out, but when I got down to the cat, I actually had to unpick some of my hand quilting because I found I'd left this piece in. <laughs> it not only it was a little because it's a little, it's a tiny little piece like that. It wasn't a ton more stiff than when you just have all the different layers of fabric that are there. Um, but the chipboard I'm using may very well have stained this if I had left that in. So I had to unpick and I had to then pull just a little area, shove my hand in and pull it out. Ah, oh, it was a joy though. I had so much fun doing it. I'm having so much fun sharing it. Um, I've shown you the back of that. I want to show you the back just so you can see this. You can see that when pressed down flat, the center also, it lays nice and flat. Lots of people with lots of tips on how to do that. Um, I will tell you though, one of the things that I'm finding with the English paper piecing, I do have to draw upon, and that's why I'm, I've been hesitant to want to necessarily share these. I do have to draw quite a bit on my understanding of quilt construction patchwork to make some of this work. Um, and I think that while it's completely doable, it does get a little fiddly when, and I will have blocks eventually that, that show um, the pudding. Let me see if I can, you see here, let's see. There's a triangle piece that comes right here. Putting those long triangle pieces on, there will be blocks that I will be sharing in the upcoming weeks very soon showing how to put, or um, that have those. 
when you're putting those blocks on, um, you could probably get into a little bit of the weeds because you end up going down to a very narrow point in which all that really is there now is seam allowance. There isn't any, any, um, you know, there's not a real point. <laughs> so while it's definitely doable, you have to be willing to kind of make it work. In my last video, I talked about when you're doing a puzzle and you know that that piece is supposed to fit, but it doesn't want to fit and you just pound it in place and you call it good. There is some of that to this. So I may make it available, but if I do, if, if you ask for it, I, if I do, it'll probably be closer to Halloween after I've posted a number of these other blocks. Um, I am designing them in such a way that I know I can make them work for me. That is not to say that, and, and I've tried to take into consideration how I make them work for me to make it easier for me, which means they may not be what other people who do English paper piecing say is how you know they would do it. I make them work, and then I make the blocks work, and they work. So this one, and again, I know that if you went out there and started searching, people make these patterns available. So, and that's their business. So that's why I'm kind of on the fence on this one. But if you would like, if you really are interested, I can try to have it with a caveat that there's no guarantees. <laughs> I can put the measurements available at, at a later time. Okay. I think that's where we're going to end it. I thought for sure this video would be shorter than the one that I'd recorded without sound, but alas, it isn't. Um, so I think I'll just end by wishing you a happy week. Uh, hopefully you will unwind with some fiber and fabric. I'm going to go and unwind with another book after this and then save the editing for a little bit later today. Um, Thank you for everyone who joined in last week and commented with my premiere. That was just so much fun. I really, I, it, it, was, it was really quite enjoyable. And it was perfect timing because there had been a blip. While overall it was a positive thing, it created, in order to accomplish the positive thing, there was a lot of anxiety. And getting the video posted, um, I was really, unsure of trying a premiere. I wasn't, I was very unsure about um, how I'd feel. I had a blast. It was wonderful. And by the end of the weekend, I finally could just really rest for the first time in a very long time and could read a book. So I'm going to go and do a little bit of reading. I have no idea what next week's fiber is going to be. Um, I'm not even sure I know what the next block is <laughs> because I have a couple that are finished and I have a couple that I'm working on and I'm just kind of deciding as we go. So stay tuned for next week. If you haven't already subscribed, hit subscribe, hit like. It always helps with the algorithms. Um, it helps get people noticing it. It's really sad though because while it gets lots of people noticing it, um, viewing time goes down dramatically. <laughs> But that is neither here nor there. I appreciate your support. I appreciate that there's other people that are out there wanting to unwind with fiber and fabric with me. And so until next week, I wish you all the best and we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>